Welcome to Think Tech on Spectrum OC16, Hawaii's weekly newscast on things that matter to tech and to Hawaii. I'm Jay Fidel. And I'm Helen Dora Hayden. In our show this time, we'll review the top five Think Tech talk shows and the staff pick from a week ago. We'll check out the elements of the best of the best and get a handle on the coverage involved. Think Tech produces some 30 talk shows every week in its downtown studio. Here's what the studio looks like. And here's a list of all our incredible Think Tech hosts. Every week, Think Tech chooses its top five Think Tech talk shows from the week before based on the number of views each of them had on the internet. For this past week, the winning shows were as follows. Number one, from the series called Bigotry in America, in a show entitled The Incident in Davis, California, with host Jay Fidel, that's me, and guests Gail Rubin, a retired attorney in California, and Shereem Kadosi, a Muslim journalist in California. Amr Shaheen from the Islamic Center of Davis gave a one-hour sermon on calling for the apocalypse against the Jews. And this is not just in Davis, this is elsewhere. This has happened at least two other times around the same time frame in California. He gave a one-hour speech. The mosque defended him. They put out a statement in defense of him. And after one week of pressure, including launching a petition, including support, uh, getting the support of local elected officials like Brad Sherman, getting a bit of media coverage, the community he finally came forward and he apologized for his statement. But when he apologized, he had the entire uh, interfaith community used as props behind him. And the apology, which I use very generously in quotes, was pretty much a statement about how he's been a model for the community. But his one hour speech is really indicative of where he stands in the interfaith community and where he stands as a Muslim and where he stands as an American Muslim right now in the landscape, which is very charged uh, politically and on racial lines and religious lines. So this is unacceptable in my eyes. Yes, well, what did he say? What are the words? What are the thoughts that he expressed in that speech? The general language that they have, that these that these individuals have, and I'll let Gail add to it too, and I've covered this with other imams that have toured in Europe, that these imams travel from country to country, and we have them homegrown here. Their language and their rhetoric is very apocalyptic, and, and I use that full knowledge of what that means. That means that there will never be peace for Muslims until Muslims fight with the Jews, that the last day will call on Muslims fighting with the Jews, and that until we get to that point, there will be no resolution, whether it's in Palestine, which is the issue that kicked off his sermons, whether it is uh, Muslims living abroad and elsewhere, elsewhere in other parts of the world. And so it's very violent. It's very hateful. It's it's uh, completely anti-Semitic. But I would say I would go further than anti-Semitism. I would say it's full out Jew hatred. So um, he spoke um, two Fridays in a row, Friday, uh, July 14th, and again on the 21st. And he repeated essentially from the same hadith. And before I quote it, it's important to know that this hadith is also incorporated into the Hamas charter. Hamas, as we know, is a designated terrorist organization that seeks the utter destruction and annihilation of the Jewish state. So this, these are the same words. Words, and I quote, he quoted, oh Allah, he's invoking the name of God to liberate us from the filth of the Jews. Oh Allah, show us the wonders of your ability that you inflict upon them. Show us the black day and count them one by one and destroy them down to the very last one. Do not spare any of them. Do destroy them and do not spare their young or their elderly. Oh Allah, turn Jerusalem and Palestine into a graveyard for the Jews. Now, I think all um, people of, of good faith and goodwill would, would agree that the, this kind of language does not belong in any civilized society, and most of all, not in a house of worship, and the fact that he is, has misappropriated a house of worship to utter these despicable, murderous words, we should all be outraged. And I... 
am a Jew, an American Jew, and I live a mile away from this mosque. And this mosque is also located directly across the street from the University of California at Davis. And a large percentage, uh, percentage of students at UC Davis attend this mosque. Um, that should be of concern to everybody. Why? Because now, if students are inclined uh, to become radicalized, of course, we know the internet is a, is a large source, all they have to do is walk across the street and listen to Imam Shaheen. Number two from the series called Habachi Talk in a show entitled Going to My Chiropractor with Gordon Bruce and guest Dr. Janaki Berman. My specialty is all of physical medicine and exercise and how they interact to, you know, and, you know, not everybody does both with me, but um, I always have, you know, like the, the PT and the personal training, like exercise tools to help people that that's what they really need to stabilize their adjustments. So very, very synergistic, mm -hmm. you know, um, it's, I mean, basically, if you get the person all aligned, well, don't you want to back that up with some specific exercise to stabilize you there yeah. so Strengthen that you know you know yeah. I don't want to just keep fixing the same thing right you know I want to I want to teach you help prevent things in the future balance yes and you know performance enhancement for athletes there's there's a lot of ways it goes but um, you know you can't tell people what to do but I prefer to you know have it be synergistic where the patient is helping themselves mm. and they're doing their exercises as well and, you know you don't have to but um, like I said, it's a it's a very good combination. It's the three. It's, it's the kind of combination of the three. So let's talk. One of the questions that I have is like, and I got I have two, but the first one I'm going to ask is, how has technology changed your patients? I mean, you know, we're a lot different now when we're coming mm -hmm. to see you. So how? And because you have technology to to help you with the insistence and, and, and treatment, but how, how have we changed how you react to us? Okay. Well, what um, you know, this is something I w I've been thinking about how because I get frustrated. It used to be pretty simple. You show a patient, this is how you need to set up your workstation. You know, in the past, I've gone into companies and done lectures on this, mm -hmm. you know, at, to avoid work comp, you know, and it, some of it's so simple. But now it's like, well, why is your monitor, if you're sitting here, why is your monitor over there? Well, because that's where the outlet is. That's where the cables are. So in other words, all the workstations are getting set up to accommodate the technology rather mm. than the actual person who's working. Mm. And one of the, the, I mean, there's a lot of problems with this. Like I said, a lot of people are, are working at right angles to their monitor. Right, they're like which this. Which is insane, right, absolutely right. insane. Right. Um, but the other phenomenon that happens, and this is a recent study on back pain, you know, like what can we do to prevent back pain in the workplace? Where is it coming from? From. Okay, well, the obvious is people that are repetitively bending over and lifting, right? Okay. You know, physical jobs where you lift a lot and, you know, of things in front of you. But equally now, the problem is what's called creep. You sit, you don't get up, and the ligaments uh, supporting your spine literally stretch out like old elastic. Mm. So, and you lose. So you lose stability. Number three, from the series called Perspectives on Global Justice, in a show entitled Don't Panic, Be Prepared, with host Beatrice Cantelmo and guests Robin Lewis and Gordon Bruce. With the 2011 earthquake and tsunami and, and the Fukushima nuclear crisis, we saw that you know, no system is flawless. You know, there are always um, areas of weakness uh, and you know, in, in the case of the tsunami, you know, unfortunately, you know, um, we learnt it, or the people uh, who were affected learnt it uh, the hard way, as, as you mentioned. Um, and and so what we saw was, you know, the government buildings and several government services were were actually affected themselves. So, you know, if you go to the, the coastal areas which were hit hardest by the tsunami. Several of the, the government agencies and, and local authorities were um, unable to respond or severely um, hampered in their response. Um, and so, you know, in many ways, especially right in the in the beginning, the the emphasis in many ways was in was on the the community and and the people themselves. Um, so, you know, I think one of the big lessons is, you know, yes, the government is there, and yes, they are well, very well prepared. But that doesn't always mean that, that you can rely 100% on the government. Um, you know, we as citizens have to be ready and, and have to have a plan um, for ourselves as well. Right. But that's one of the key lessons. And I, I think another lesson was that, you know, 
it's it's too late to have conversations after the fact, after earthquakes happen. We need to be having conversations and building um, strategic partnerships you know, between government, between the private sector, between NGOs, um, well before these things happen, mm -hmm. so that when they happen, we're in a good position to respond. So um, we have a, a household um, level disaster preparedness training program, which um, essentially targets families. So we found that, you know, if you're at work, there's usually some kind of plan at the workplace. If you're at school, there's uh, the school should have an emergency response plan. Um, but if you're at home or if you're all, you know, if you're scattered, uh, if your loved ones are scattered, then there's a real problem because there's no um, synchronized um, plan. So we thought, you know, why don't we target family and, and help them make their own disaster plan so that when something happens, um, they know exactly where to go. Number four from the series called On the Street in a show entitled Hawaii's Feral Cat Problem. Is killing cats the solution with host Carol Cox and a number of guests on the street? I'm down here at 4th Street Mall, Think Tech Hawaii, and uh, we're just asking people along the way, about these proposed rules that the governor is considering allowing the DOE bar, the Department of Boating and Recreation, DLNR, to actually shoot cats or kill them in any manner that they desire. It's pretty horrible. Yeah? Yeah, that seems extremely inhumane and immoral. Are you a cat owner or a pet owner? Pet owner, not cat. Okay. I have a dog. But uh, yeah, this is the, the concern is that they want to sign this bill, want the governor to sign this bill and be able to just shoot, poison, trap, euthanize, anything. Oh, that just, it sounds completely awful. Wow, I can't believe that they would propose such a thing. A reason, I mean, aren't there um, stuff where you can get animals off the streets and put them in like Shelter. a project, yeah, shelters, and then if no one wants them, then do what we've been doing for years by putting them to sleep if nobody wants to adopt them or take care of them. So you, th you would vote on the side of... Oh. It's inhumane in a certain way. It's like if you don't want us shooting people on the streets, why are you going to go and shoot a living thing? It's also, I mean, I guess we hunt also, like deer or whatever, but I mean, it's kind of wrong. Well, I think they should issue permits to the hunters or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it's your purpose to the hunters. Yeah. And, and not, then not do the random killing. And not all. just randomly kill them. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And, then, and, and, and not let the, uh, uh, the uh, animals uh, rot. Rot. And I think that's part of the controversy. Um, no, I don't, I don't think they should just be able to go free range hunting cats. Okay. I think there's a better alternative. Something what, more kind humane. Of, what would you suggest to them to do? I don't know what they do now, mm -hmm. um, but I don't know if there's any kind of group or coalition that goes around and, you know, cages mm -hmm. them or someone who would, you know, like the Humane Society, you can call it. I don't so. agree with that. I have three cats myself and they were all, they're all feral. Mm -hmm. I got them fixed through Popoki and, um, you know, there's ways to, to get them fixed. Um, where you poi don't have to spend, popoki. yeah, poi dogs and popoki, mm -hmm. and they they fixed my cats and they're happy cats now. So, mm -hmm. I mean, they're they're still living, they're still living, you know, animals that we we have to take care of, and and I don't agree in shooting shooting them to get rid of them, but but like we, I think we have to take care of the problem of um, them multiplying by by taking them to those nonprofit organizations like Poi Dog and Popoki, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and everybody do their part to um, take care of the matter that way. Uh, well, I think there needs to be humanity with it, so they need to be, I'm not in favor of just shooting animals. Number five, from the series called Where the Drone Leads, in a show entitled The Spreading Tapestry of Dronism, with Ted Ralston and guest John Franklin, so the, the matchmaking function within the electronics uh, is, is okay on high density. It's not going to bother it. I don't think so. I mean, to be honest, okay. in, in our own testing, we tend to be pilot limited, and uh, I haven't been able to put up <laughs> okay. 15 at a time. 
You know, that's a, that's a, you know, editorially, but offline, that whole subject of pilot limitations is certainly a big factor in what we out here call the workforce development aspect of education. We don't have enough drone pilots to serve the commercial industry if they ask for one more person. And uh, we're using airline pilots and this sort of thing, uh, reprocessing them in this domain. And uh, uh, to, together, we have to come up with an educational framework that will produce educated people in the, and trained people, certified people in the world of flying, in the world of design, in the world of counter drone. So it's a really it's a exciting big gap time. Getting your 107 and actually. Uh, <laughs> flying a mission, successful mission. Yeah, 107 has its own downsides that are subject of yet another discussion called liability. But in any case, uh, talk about the company. What else you make besides the electronic uh, detection systems? So we uh, we started life as uh, Drone Shield started life as uh, uh, a passive acoustic detection company. So we've always passive been in the counter drone business. Okay. But about two three years ago, we were using microphones to do it. And microphones are actually an interesting way to do it. I can't tell you how many times, when I, like for example, in my story when I was on vacation, the first thing I do is I hear it. I don't, I don't see it. So I, maybe it's just I've been doing this so long that I'm, I'm tuned into that. But without a doubt, I'm going to hear it before I see it. We also have a staff pick. This time it was from the series called Law Across the Sea in a show entitled All the World's a Stage and All the Men and Women Merely Lawyers with host Mark Schlav and his guest, attorney Alan Ma. Well, being an immigrant, and I, I and, and of course, I also uh, speak uh, uh, three different dialects of Chinese, and I was very involved in the Chinese community. And uh, I saw a lot of people, they really needed help. Mm -hmm. And they couldn't command English, and they didn't understand American law. And often, because of their ignorance, and they put themselves in difficult positions. So that kind of uh, motivated me to become a lawyer, to be able to help some of those people in the immigrant community. And you saw these problems as, as you were growing up here in Hawaii after you arrived? Basically. That's correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and that kind of inspired you, is what I'm hearing, to, to look towards the law, or look to a way to help, help people. That's right? correct. So, okay, so what, what happened next in, in your 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 life. You went you went to law school and and, and you, you were here in Hawaii, but you went away to law school. Right. Well, I was very fortunate. I was uh, uh, awarded this uh, national scholarship called CLIO. Essentially, Congress, and at least in those days, they select about 250 uh, students nationwide to receive scholarship to have a special uh, assistant for them to go to law school. But those uh, scholarship recipients must commit to going back to their, to, their, to, their, to their own state. In my case, I came back to Hawaii in part because I received the scholarship, and my commitment was to help the people in Hawaii. And so after I concluded my legal education, I came back to Hawaii to work. A scholarship sounds like a, a Pretty good deal, pretty good idea. Is it still going on? Do they I believe it is. Okay. And I believe uh, the, the program is still going on. Okay, so, all right, so you, 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 you got the scholarship, you finished law school, then what, what happened in, in your career? Or where, where did you, you know, you, you, you had this feeling about the immigration law. Where did that take you? Uh, of course, when I started looking for jobs and I knock on doors of you know, at that time, and uh, all the prominent immigration law firms or lawyers. And uh, I came across my then uh, employer, who became my mentor, and subsequently my law partner, Mr. Ronald Odenberg. If you weren't able to write these links down, you can always find them in our daily email advisory. If you don't get our daily email advisory, you can sign up to get them on thinktechhawaii.com. And these are only samplings from the top five in a staff pick from our 30 weekly talk shows. There are, of course, many more. To see these shows in their entirety, go to thinktechhawaii.com or youtube.com slash thinktechhawaii. Great diversity, great community coverage, and great content at ThinkTech. Yep, every day better.
And now let's check out our ThinkTech schedule of events going forward. ThinkTech broadcasts its talk shows live on the internet from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. on weekdays. Then we broadcast our early shows all night long. And some people listen to them all night long. If you missed a show or if you want to replay or share any of our shows, they're all archived on demand on thinktechhawaii.com and YouTube. For our audio stream, go to thinktechhawaii.com slash radio. And we post all our shows as podcasts on iTunes. Visit thinktechhawaii.com for our weekly calendar and live stream and YouTube links. Or, better yet, sign up on our email list and get our daily email advisories. ThinkTech is a high-tech green screen studio at Pioneer Plaza. If you want to see it or be part of our live audience, or if you want to participate in our programs, contact shows at thinktechhawaii.com. If you want to pose a question or make a comment, call 808-374-2014 and help us raise public awareness on ThinkTech. More than ever, ThinkTech lives on the internet. And yes, in its ongoing efforts to push the innovation envelope, ThinkTech is getting into crowdfunding and also into animation. I'm Rachel with ThinkTech Hawaii. Help ThinkTech Hawaii. Why? Because ThinkTech helps you and the people of Hawaii by giving a free platform to share information, ideas, and news on matters important to our community. We want to make Hawaii a better place and raise awareness through citizen journalists like our volunteer hosts and public engagement. How do we do this? We produce and stream 30 video talk shows a week on our site, thinktechhawaii.com, and post them to YouTube, community TV, and cable and as podcasts. We do this from our downtown studio and from equipment that live streams from anywhere in the state. We work to find the best of Hawaii and let everyone know about it. To continue to do this, we need to raise money to keep our studio and studio staff going and to go to the neighbor islands and cover people and stories there. So this November is Give Thanks for Think Tech Month. You'll be seeing more about this campaign and more about our efforts to animate. Why don't you tune into thinktechhawaii.com, where community matters. We're rolling out a new show. It's called Trump Loy. Guess who that's about? Check it out. Go ahead. Give us a thumbs up on YouTube or send us a tweet at thinktechhi. We'd like to know how you feel about the issues and events that affect our lives in these islands. We want to stay in touch with you, and we'd like you to stay in touch with us. Let's think together. And now, here's this week's Think Tech commentary. Okay, we all have problems. We all have so much to do. How are we going to get it all done? How are we going to cope? There's a very famous saying by Confucius, the man who moves a mountain begins by carrying away small stones. I often wonder if I have what it takes to finish what I had started. I'm sure you have heard the expression, making mountains out of molehills. Well, let's see if we can make sense of moving mountains. Whether it's your body or your mind that is forced to ask the question, can I do it? Let's try to move that mountain. How did we get here? The road to this mountain of reflection is long and arduous. All we are doing is living our life and face the pressures of doing the best we can, right? In life, we all tackle mountains that test both our mental and physical strength. To do that and to do it well, we have to move a lot of small stones, endure pain, jump over barriers, break ceilings, work hard for hours, and deal with discouragement. The key is to clear your head and process your situation. We have to weigh the pros and cons and dig deep for some answers. You have to come to a place where you know what to do. It really becomes an epiphany moment. Quitting it is not an option, right? Remember, one small stone at a time. You have to be present where you are, not get ahead of yourself, and start the journey. We'll be right back to wrap up this week's edition of ThinkTech. But first, we want to thank our underwriters. Grateful thanks to our underwriters. The Annie Sinclair Newton Memorial Fund, the Atherton Family Foundation, the Bernice and Conrad Von Ham Fund, Castle and Cook, Hawaii, the Center for Microbial Oceanography Research and Education, Collateral Analytics, the Cook Foundation, the Hawaii Community Foundation, 
the Hawaii Council of Associations of Apartment Owners, Hawaii Energy, the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology, Hawaiian Electric Companies, Galen Ho of BAE Systems, Integrated Security Technologies, Kamehameha Schools, Carol Mon Lee and the Friends of ThinkTech, MW Group, the Omidyar Ohana Fund, the Scheidler Family Foundation, the Sydney Stern Memorial Trust, Yuriko J. Sugimura. Thanks also to our viewers like you. Okay, Helen, that wraps up this week's edition of ThinkTech. Remember, you can watch ThinkTech on Spectrum OC16 several times every week. Can't get enough of it, just like Helen does. For additional times, check out OC16.tv. For lots more ThinkTech videos and for underwriting and sponsorship opportunities on ThinkTech, visit ThinkTechHawaii.com. Be a guest or a host, a producer or an intern, and help us reach and have an impact on Hawaii. Thanks for being part of our ThinkTech family and for supporting our open discussion of tech, energy, diversification, and global awareness in Hawaii. And of course, in the ongoing search for innovation everywhere you can find it. You can watch this show throughout the week and tune in next Sunday evening for our next important weekly episode. I'm Jay Fidel. And I'm Helen Dora Hyden. Aloha, everyone. Mm -hmm.